Okay, sorry, you're going to have to crane your neck this way for this portion. Um, okay, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come down today <laughs> for this event. Um, really appreciate it. I know it's a Friday evening, but bear with me. So this event is hosted by Women Who Code Singapore. Uh, if you'd like to contact us or if you're interested in checking us out, uh, you can contact us through oh, sorry, through our mail, um, the website. We also have a Facebook page or a Slack page if you'd like to join. Uh, these are our members, so give a little wave to the audience just so you can identify them later on if you'd like to talk to them. Okay, so if you still don't know why you're here, don't worry, we're not a cult. We're just a community that likes to inspire women to excel in technology careers. Uh, if you join us, you have access to programs and events such as uh, these kinds of panels or we also have workshops that teach you uh, certain technical skills like Python, CSS, HTML. Uh, we also have a monthly newsletter that the global team sends out. Um, we have something called hashtag applaud her and this is quite interesting whereby you can nominate someone if you see that your friend has achieved something, you know, she got a job at this great tech company and you want to applaud her, so you, you would hashtag and applaud her and tag her in it. Uh, you, you would also have access to scholarships, conference tickets and also job boards, so anyone who's looking, check us out. So this is an upcoming event that we have. It's a conference hosted, uh, it's a collaborative con uh, conference actually, uh, which is going to be held in March and it's uh, going to be an event held by our Singapore team and also the Manila team and the team in Malaysia. So if you're interested, sign up for this, the URL is up there. So write it down, take a picture. Big thank you to our host. SP Digital, Michael, he's been helping to organize all this, getting everything set up. Uh, do you want to say a few words? <laughs> okay, he's shy. Okay, that's fine. Okay, great. Okay, so I think let's delve right into the panel, what you guys have been waiting for. I think I like that it's a, it's a nice group down here, so we can have more interactions. Okay. So without further ado, let's begin with a round of introductions. Uh, do you guys have mics, by the way? Okay. Do we need them? Uh, yes. We were recording, so kind of, uh, yes. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Amanda, and I'm a consultant with Deloitte Consulting, specifically in the Technology, Strategy, and Architecture Division. Um, and I'll bring it on to Carolyn to introduce herself. Uh, my name is Carolyn, and I'm a senior tech lead with Oliver Wyman Labs, and that is the technical data science analytics uh, division of, La of Oliver Wyman. And I've been working with the firm for about seven years. Hi, I'm Akshita Joshi, and I'm a manager at Bain & Company. I work on connecting the ecosystem of startups and VCs to our corporate network um, because we believe that incumbents and insurgents can do better if they work together. And I've been with Bain for about three years in different roles. Godman. <laughs> Hi, I'm Akshita Kaya. So I'm a senior consultant at Adelphi Digital. So we basically look at digital consulting essentially for government and non-government clients here. Hi everyone, my name is Winter. I am a technical consultant for Google Marketing Platform. Have been on the job for one year. Hi everyone, my name is Isha. I work as a senior consultant developer with Mavericks Consulting. Uh, I've been a consultant for a s more than seven years now, and I've worked across multiple domains and technologies in my role. Thank you. Perfect. So the point of today's panel is to discuss two topics. Uh, number one, technology consulting in general, and number two, gender diversity. So huge thanks to our panelists for taking the time out. Bit of applause for them uh, for today. And let's get started. Question number one. Oh my god, I feel like this is who wants to be a millionaire. <laughs> okay, no pressure though. Do we get a million? <laughs> no prize money. You have to go down like pizza. Pizza. Yes. this way or can it be whoever? Whoever who wants to jump in first. No pressure, like I said. <laughs> okay, what is technology consulting to you? In other words, how do you define and describe technology consulting? And how can technology consultants value add to this translation of technology into verifiable business objectives for the clients? Don't be shy. <laughs> uh, for me, essentially, consulting or tech consulting means you 
try to solve a business problem through technical solutions. So you first go ahead, you understand what the client's pain points are, what are the stakeholders' requirements, and then you try to create a vision out of it. Once you understand the vision, you have you develop KPIs, and then you try to deliver that solution through technology. So you will design, you'll build your prototype, you'll build it, you'll deliver it, and then you'll reiterate essentially because it's generally an agile process that follows. If anybody wants to add on. Um, I think for me, technology consulting is uh, two aspects of it. One is definitely the, the tech part of it, right? Where you're trying to evaluate tools and technologies that work best for your client and like you say, the pain points they have. What, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And the other is the consulting aspect where you're helping the clients make the right decision or well, what they think is the right decision for them with complete information at hand that you can help them with. You're helping them make an informed decision based on your experience, based on things that may or may not have worked for you in the past. So technology and consulting together lead to what um, at the end you're trying to achieve, which is to build a better product or to deliver something that is a ver verifiable business outcome. And um, that's what it means to me. Uh, I'll take uh, sort of, is this on? I think, it, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, technology consulting is obviously not fixing mics. Uh, I'll take a 20,000 foot view. So in our space, digital transformation is often synonymous with technology consulting. And digital in itself then becomes synonymous in some ways with innovation. And so a lot of what we do is help our large clients who are struggling with keeping up with um, startups as well as tech companies in that space, move faster and come up with solutions um, and products and market that will improve customer experiences, but also um, improve their own internal processes and really be able to you know, make sure that they don't lose out on their market share. I guess I can take a very uh, personal approach because I've been in this field for only a year. Um, so might not have that much experience as these um, um, ladies uh, here. But basically I was a software developer for three years in an investment bank. And then um, uh, one year ago I was taking the decision of a career movement. I want to do something that has something to do with people. I feel like there are guys around me who are very, uh, into algorithm, very into logical things, can be there the whole day, you know, dealing with the complex problems, which I can do it as well. But I feel I add the most value when I, when I, you know, communicate or being the bridge between the end user and the technology. So I, when I was actually looking for the job, I actually didn't know this role, which I'm in today, was a consultant role. So I was just telling um, one of the recruiter I met in Google that, um, you know, I want to do something that you can, I can still do technology, I can still program, uh, at the same time I can talk to people. And then they figured this role for me, and I found that it's a perfect match. So I guess to that point, I've my understanding of technical consultant is being the bridge between end user and the technology and being able to cross the gap between and translate the technical to non-technical users and vice versa. Okay, Carolyn, would you like to jump in? Otherwise I'll move on. Like I have no value add after these answers, <laughs> to be honest with you. I'd be repeating more of what they said. Okay, but, sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, <laughs> question number two. So now that you guys understand what technology consulting means to you, what are some of the common misconceptions people have about tech consultants? Um, for instance, some people think that you guys are product managers. How can we combat these misconceptions and communicate that more effectively? Are you talking about communicating it to the client? Or are you talking about communicating it to the internal business? I feel like there are challenges that happen about expectations internally to our firm, even, as well as with mm -hmm. the client. So I think it's just about education and evangelism. People make assumptions about what I do all the time. They don't understand the, the things that I do every day. And I guess how many of you understand what a tech lead does, probably, at a tech, no, seriously, <laughs> right? It's like something with computers is what people usually tell me. So it's like it's a it's a mixture of what Winter said about your that, that bridge between the, the client and, and the business, I should say, and technology. 
and then you're orchestrating, you know, what happens to get whatever they want delivered in a timely fashion, in a sustainable fashion. But, you know, misconceptions of the role, you just have to have those conversations at the start with the client. But even internally, it's about just constantly evangelizing because I feel like when you work at certain firms like Bain or Oliver Wyman, I think there's a, the struggle between the old and the new. I'm not sure if you see that, but with Oliver Wyman, we definitely do, where you have the old parts of the business and they don't understand what you do and the new part of the business, which I belong to, so. Yeah, someone stepped across the slide with all the different acronyms we're using now because for some reason <laughs> technology is always associated with acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the big misconceptions, especially in the consulting space that we're in, is that you have to be technical or a coder to be able to be a technical consultant. That's not true. Uh, I work closely with coders and with engineers um, and designers, but my role is to problem solve and to bring their expertise to bear as needed and to communicate with the clients, structure the problems. As a result, I learn more about what they do and that I need to be able to have that language. Um, but I don't need coding skills to help clients solve problems as to how they can apply technology to their business. So, sorry, I often <laughs> come across the opposite problem to what Akshita has that, oh, you're a consultant, which means you don't write code. It's like, no, that's not really how <laughs> consulting works. So that's a big misconception that I encounter quite often that consultants is all talk, talk, talk. It's mm -hmm. all fluff and big words and fancy mm -hmm. acronyms, but they're not hands-on people. They don't know what's going on on the ground. And at my current client, one of the other projects we were doing with them, it, those exact words were spelled out that, oh, you don't know what this is because you, you've not seen the systems. Like, yeah, we have. We pushed code like yesterday. So no, we don't know what's happening here. And that's why we're telling you why this needs to be different. So that's definitely one big misconception. And I think that stems from the fact that sometimes you do have consultants who talk a lot, they have these bright big ideas, but they miss the big picture and miss what's happening on the ground. And that works against the rest of us who don't have that. So yeah, sorry, that's <laughs> my take. Perfect. Just plus one on that perspective. I think, um, I guess, depends on the nature of the product you support or the, the, the client you work with. At least for my experience, I do need to stay hands on to be able to talk the real language, you know, the real stuff of my clients. I feel like it's, um, I guess it depends on the, the nature of the job or nature of the product. So being consultant doesn't, doesn't mean you will not be hands on or mean you have to be hands on. So, yeah. I think just, you know, hearing your last three conversations, I think totally depends on the company as well that you work on that as a consultant what do they expect from you because for my at least when I'm a consultant I'm hands-on because I'm writing the specifications I'm trying to bridge that gap where I can work the business requirements into technical specifications but I may not be coding essentially so I think one of the misconceptions is when you're applying for a job for a consulting understand what your job role is because consultant is sometimes just used as a word, as a buzzword for everything. So try to understand what your, what the job requires, first of all. And it's just not about your technical expertise. It also comes a lot about your soft skills. Consult, like what we're not talking about here, it requires stakeholder management. It requires understanding requirements, managing your team, getting that solution delivered. So multiple aspects of a consultant, depending on which company, which product, and everything that you work on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think another, when you, you spoke about soft skills, I think another big thing that I have personally seen consultants miss a lot is empathy and the ability to listen. Mm -hmm. Like, especially for the more fancy consultancies, I don't want to take names, <laughs> uh, but um, that's what I used to hear a lot about my last company that, oh, you people are super arrogant. You think you're always right. And that did stem from a very real place where a lot of us did go in saying, oh, you're doing everything wrong, let me tell you how to fix this. Um, and what I've learned over the years is that a big aspect of being a consultant is being able to listen to what your client is saying, being able to read between the lines that, oh, I know you're saying that this process is screwed up, but actually your problem may lie in that other thing that you were talking about, which is causing this problem, uh, this process to be screwed up. Um, and empathy, definitely, understanding where your client is coming from, understanding where where they are missing the perspective that they've called you in to bring. And I think that's a big, big aspect of being a consultant. 
perfect. Would any of the big fancy names like to weigh in? <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. Nah, no, no, <laughs> just kidding. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, how has the field of tech consulting changed in the past five years? And I know some of you perhaps have not spent the past five years, but where do you what do you predict will happen within the next five to ten years? If not? I will answer that because I'm old and I've done this like 150 <laughs> years. The traditional consulting model was very much based on Excel models, right? You're an Excel power user. You do PowerPoints. You do something, six weeks later you're done and you leave. And now what we're finding is an evolution of the consultant, the technical consultant being needing to be a lot more immersed in the analytics and in the numbers and using tools like Python to get the answers that the clients are looking for. In addition, they're needing, the clients are also demanding for some sustainable solution to roll out. They don't want just you to come in and drop off some you know, model and be done. They want something they can actually integrate into their business change processes. And so there's like a much more permanent kind of solution they're looking for versus like a one-off model that they want to use for their business decisions. And so I feel like there's this huge infusion of much more sexy technology, a big focus on big data, um, a focus on applications, a focus on the end-to-end -end experience, especially from a, like a, a customer experience perspective, and the user experience. They're suddenly focusing on everything digital and, and truly digital, not just the buzzword, but like truly versus the one-off answers I used to ask for before. So I think whether or not consultants like it, they're going to have to evolve or die. So. Yeah, I think you've said it's everything true. exactly <coughs> right. The only thing I'd add to that is that org is becoming a big part of technical consulting in the sense that organizations also cannot work the way they used to, which was in a waterfall manner. So they planned for nine months, then they went and built and they took it to market and suddenly you're like, oh, this didn't work. We just spent a hundred million on something that nobody wants, right? So organizations are becoming more agile and therefore consultancies are also becoming more agile in the way they work and what they train organizations on. So culture is a really, really big part of any transformation we undertake for clients. And I think that's more so now than it has ever been before. I think the focus has essentially changed to, as everybody has rightly said, so that <coughs> customer experience, improve me, improving the customer journey, and even data privacy and security these days has become a lot of huge concern as we're looking at Facebook and everything, like we're looking at data privacy issues these days more and security. Um, I think apart from what everybody just said, the other aspect of what I see tech consulting has become that it's become a very fuzzy field in some sense. Like you don't really know what falls under the bracket of technology consulting anymore. Is it, is it me coming in helping uh, you do architect, uh, make architectural decisions? Is it me coming in helping you write solutions? Is it me coming in helping you build better software using newer and more effective practices? There's so many different aspects to it. And I think that will continue to happen because we're living in a world where technology has become very, very pervasive to everything that we do. Like, Literally everything is on our fingertips now and um, the more that happens, the more the need for technology consulting comes in because now everybody wants to go digital and it's like you said that consultants need to evolve or die and because the uses of technology are, we're discovering new and new avenues for it every single day. Um, I guess I can just comment from uh, the product I support from this perspective. Um, so for Google Marketing Platform, right, we're looking at like grow the scope. I guess in the future, uh, let's say one year or five year scale, the group of people we're gonna consult with is gonna change. Mm -hmm. So for now we consult with end users, let's say marketers, advertisers, um, or media agency. And But in the future, if we want to scale up to cover more of the market, then we're gonna consult our partners, meaning who are going to certify to use our platform. And the partners will then go forward to you know, serve the end client. So I guess that means that we need to, as technical consultant, we need to bring us up, you know, upskill to be more technical to be able to consult our technical partners. Great. Thank you so much. I think that really sums it up. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on to the next topic, which is about gender diversity. So given today's current social environment, 
there are still certain social perceptions that women have to deal with. For instance, um, assuming skills and experience are the same, a man would be picked over a pregnant woman for a certain job. Or perhaps there are less women at the top positions in companies because women choose to focus on the home instead of their career. So this could result in challenges that can make it more difficult for women to access opportunities, networks and resources. In your view, what are some of these systemic challenges and what role can advocates or managers play in addressing these challenges? I think a big one in our case is work-life balance and so <laughs> very tactically in consulting you travel mm -hmm. yeah and especially in this region and so if you just had a baby it is hard for you to be able to leave for three days a week um, especially if you're doing if you're pumping and then what do you do with the baby during the first few months and also you, you want to be there just because of you know anxiety with the first child and I have a few friends who are going through this right now um, and I don't think our system is really well set up. So Bain's trying a bunch of different things. You know, they're very aware of it. They're trying a bunch of different things around flexible roles, around um, you know keeping you in Singapore on Singapore projects for the first year. Um, but I don't think anyone has really cracked it in terms of what it means for your career progression. I don't know what the rest here have experienced. I think for me, in my experience, one thing that systemically needs to change is for businesses to stop making assumptions about what their uh, female workforce wants or doesn't want. Um, to quote an example of a friend of mine, um, she was eyeing a an, an um, offshore, uh, not offshore, an, an overseas assignment and she went and asked about it and they said, oh, we assumed you wouldn't want it now that you're married. And that doesn't make sense, especially when a company claims to be very pro-women and pro-diversity and say, we really want to help and bring more women into the workforce and then you have people who do stuff like that. And that fault, that make, makes up a big part of it that yes, for women who have certain responsibilities at home, maybe because they have kids or maybe they have elderly parents, it could be other things that they're involved in. Yes, it might be a problem, but ask them. There are women who have zero responsibilities, who can travel at the drop of a hat. Ask them, right? So making assumptions is something that organizations, I think, need to stop doing. Just talk to your people, dude. They're all right there. So that's definitely one. And like you say, that nobody's really cracked it. My last company had, uh, they had children's rooms. They had, um, they had nannies come in. They had uh, tie-ups with local play schools and crushes and that sort of thing and it was very common to have people bring in their kids and the parents are walking, the kids are coloring on the table or running around with somebody, everybody's playing with them and while that helps but personally I don't know if that's a very sustainable thing that can last. I obviously can't answer because I don't have kids but um, from, from what I've seen it does take a toll and it does at some point you're still distracted when your child's running around and you don't know where they are or what's happening with it. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents on it. Um, I guess I can share a bit of my experience in Tokyo. Uh, I was working in Japan for two years before um, coming to this job. I think in Singapore we are in a way better situation. Um, I, I, so, cause I, well, I was working for still for American company though when I was in Tokyo, but I would say the general perception of women in Japan is still um, there's there room to be uh, to improve. You know, especially as in let's say women, you are you are supposed to be very mild, very gentle in the workplace. Uh, if you are uh, with a group of men, you are supposed to let's say you are going for a casual dinner, you are supposed to serve tea on the table, which is I mean, I, I found that very unbelievable, but that was a perception of the society. Um, so I feel like here, luckily for the companies I work with, uh, we, I feel very supported by the company. Uh, well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to comment on mom perspective because I haven't got a kid. I guess I would say there are flexibility arrangements, there are you know, um, or flexible hours. So I think um, I feel very supported, yeah, in my role. Well, even I feel supportive in my role, uh, but I think at the same time, apart from the mothers, I think we should also be uh, concerned about unconscious biases that you might have. 
unconscious biases in a way that you might expect a woman not to know about technology, where people might face that. Second, could also be as simple as uh, the woman is not allowed to speak in a meeting where you talk about the word mansplaining. So it's as a rule, as a manager in your meeting, whoever is conducting the meeting, it becomes quite important to actually call out on that person and ask them what are your viewpoints and let the person speak. Let them know, you know, don't interrupt, don't uh, unconscious biases affect you, either in recruitment, either in negotiation of your salaries, either while you're, you know, uh, going through meetings. And at the end, don't let it affect you. Be assertive, go ahead, do your job. If, 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 if that bias is there, if you face that difficulty, just be assertive, talk about it, be open about it, and go ahead, do a good job. Nobody can stop you after that. I'm going to follow up on what Winter was talking about, about Japan, but I think just a problem anywhere is when you have a woman say the same thing a man does and it's perceived as bossy, mm -hmm. and that drives me crazy. That is like a burr in the saddle for me. It's like the guy saying the same thing, oh, he's assertive. You're like, what the hell, right? And it's like, I guess it falls in line with the unconscious bias, but it's just like people, there, there's subtleties in how they perceive gender, right? Women should be quieter more subservient, you know, and not so brash, but the same traits in a man are seen as, you know, admirable and, you know, to be emulated, and it's frustrating. Um, I don't get that problem because I'm loud and scary and tall, but I think that if you have a smaller <laughs> stature, then you do struggle with that, like, more, because it's easier for you to get enveloped and swallowed by your, by your male dominant peers. So what I do try to encourage is when I'm in a meeting with a female who says some great stuff, I'll echo chamber it, just to give her that voice and support her, so to encourage her to keep going and say things and just keep that kind of dynamic going. And if I see a guy trying to mansplain, it definitely sets me off and I would definitely be like, can you please let her finish? You know, I'm, I don't let any of that fly because it bothers me. And then people don't sometimes realize it and they'll go, oh, I'm sorry, right? Most people are very respectful when you interject and you try to correct them. So I've yet to have someone go, Carolyn, no, I'm going to keep mansplaining, right? <laughs> So it's just about correcting on the spot and giving feedback so people recognize it, especially in a public forum, and then they learn and they keep going. So the subtle things every day in the dynamics. I love that point. I mean, <laughs> my fiance is in the audience and he listens to me uh, have to mansplain me all the time. <laughs> um, no, but bringing it up is really critical because a lot of the times people don't know they're doing it. Um, for example, some of you might have faced this. You say something, you give a great idea in a meeting, and then a guy says the same thing again, but louder, and then everyone's like, oh, that's a fantastic idea, yeah. <laughs> um, the thing is, I've experienced this in a so social situation, and I brought it up, I was like, do you realize that I said that exact same thing? And the person had no idea, they just hadn't heard me because I hadn't emphasized it enough. Um, but I brought it to light there, and it <laughs> now they're much more cognizant of it. It's hard to do in the moment, um, it it's very hard room, to do, you know, um, but, but it's sort of the only way. There's a really exactly. great article um, that maybe we can forward across. It was yeah. in Fortune Broadsheet. If you don't subscribe, you should. It is a Fortune magazine focused on women specifically and like uh, women in business. And it talked about this woman who, you know, her boss had this uh, pretty uh, sexist comment in a meeting. Um, and she and everyone started laughing and then she asked him, can I speak with you outside? And then outside she told him, I don't think this was appropriate, and this is why. And then he went back in and he apologized to her in front of everybody and told everybody that, look, jokes like this are not appropriate and we shouldn't do it. And it was really powerful because we sort of carried, you know, the women who came before us have done a lot for us. I mean, sort of owe it to the next generation as well. Yeah. So, one change that I... One change that I've been trying to make with myself and with other people around me is to stop using the word guys to refer to a group of people. Yeah. Um, everybody at work, both at my current company and my last company, hates it when I do that. But I just be like, uh, you said guys. <laughs> so they, they hate it when I do that. But, the, but that, that essentially stems from the fact that language shapes the way we think, right? And when, when, I, when somebody says, oh, that guy over there, you're never thinking, oh, it could be a man or a woman. You're saying, of course it's a man because you said guy. But then somehow guys in turn becomes gender neutral. And I understand that people don't mean it that way. People never mean it to mean, oh, you're, it's a group of men and I'm ignoring the women in it. But it's the subtleties, the subtle changes we make in our language. Like people pay attention when you use 
something other than guys people team folks peeps depending on the situation um and then they realized and then they're like oh wait you didn't say guys right now that's interesting and i've had i've successfully converted a few people if i may brag a little bit <laughs> um so i think maybe if if you'd like i i'd really like you to try doing this for some time stop using the word guys to refer to a group of people alternatives are folks team people y'all <laughs> <laughs> i think that's a really interesting insight like um i realized that uh, most of the things that i hear people would say oh and ladies as well you know it's sort of like an afterthought yeah actually that's an interesting thing to do actually be aware i'm of. sorry i have an anecdote yeah. to share on that mm -hmm. um uh, a former tech lead of mine who whose wife is a very staunch feminist and so he by default has to listen to a lot of stuff that he doesn't realize on his own um he sent out an email to a group uh, to our team saying hey girls da 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 and everybody just went did you just write hey girls You're like well nobody cares if i write hey guys so i just wanted to flip it around a little bit so that's another strategy you can try to to see if people realize it <laughs> okay great so how have you built confidence and resiliency over the course of your career as a female in tech consulting what was your inspiration and what is your motivation I can go first. Yeah. I feel like I've been talking more than everyone else. <laughs> Sorry, please feel free to ask me to shut up. Um so I think one very I've been very lucky to have uh role models that I can look up to, women who are very um strong in their feet, they know what they want. They know that they will not back down when someone tells them, "Oh, you're being so aggressive." Like why are you being hysterical and they have been told that in their face um but it's it's those women and the feedback they've given me the tips they've given me which have made me realize over the course of time that the only thing you can do the only biggest support you have is yourself and the only thing you can do is like you were saying earlier right just stand your ground and be assertive in what you're doing have confidence in what you're doing call people out when they talk over you in meetings or when they they make sexist comments they have they have these subtle microaggressions where oh uh, see women you have so many more options when it comes to formal clothing like how is that even relevant like why does it matter um but i i had that i had somebody tell me that and um just calling th that stuff out and yeah definitely having confidence in your own skills is is something that leads to it it evolves over time and eventually you get to a point where you don't care what people say or think because you you know that you're saying the right thing um i guess for my case i same approach i try to find a role model but the thing is in the role that i've been in um, always the majority is men so i don't restrict myself to find a female role model i just look up to people who are doing very well in their job and and then you know try to try to role model um after them and and at the same time um we do have a uh, very like a women community in the workplace where we empower each other i found that's actually very powerful you know like there are some seniors in my team or in my neighbor team who um have been on the job longer than me we can have some casual conversation talk about you know non work related stuff work related stuff and you feel very empowered by them you can be more like comfortable sharing more personal like from a personal touch perspective i feel that's that's very you know supportive Uh, for me personally my role model is my mother who is a doctor so I essentially work from home flexible working hours do not work there <laughs> so essentially growing as a child i've seen how work and you know also take care of us as children essentially that as a child has made me more confident made me more independent so those traits that you know at that point of time when my mother could do it i think essentially i know for a fact that even i can where i have more opportunities where i have more flexible hours work from home than my mother did or has even now so i think that gives me that confidence to go ahead and make it manageable so what also worked for her was also a supportive father like a supportive husband for her trying to find that partner who works with you who understand what your priorities are 
and is able to support childcare as well. Like, you should be able to go go to those trips, and the father can take care of it. Trying to find that balance is important, and yeah, that that helps you move ahead in life. Uh, I would say three things. One is care less about being liked. I, when I was in my early 20s, I cared a lot about being liked, and then I went to business school with a crisis of confidence because I was very good at what I did, but I didn't feel like people liked me enough. And then I got feedback saying you're too docile and you know you're really not a good leader this way. And then I did a class which was actually about uh, we used to read books and then you know discuss these books together. There was an actual business school class, which mm -hmm. I did the math and I paid probably like two thousand dollars for. But <laughs> <laughs> we read the same book and we talked about the protagonist and. 50% of the people had a positive opinion and 50% of people had a negative opinion. Same book, exact same matter. So, you know, that led me to the conclusion that no matter what you do, not everyone's gonna like you and that's fine. So I think that would be the first one is you don't have to be liked. The second one is, you know, so experiment with your leadership style because doing all of those experiments really helped me find what works for me. Um, and the third one is to what you said, find the right partner. I had a partner who didn't build me up for a long time that, uh, ended up making me not be very confident in who I was. And now I have one who celebrates my wins, which I think as a woman, it can be hard sometimes to find someone who does that. And um, you know, it makes life so much easier. And my career success is also, I think, a large part because of the fact that I have that support at home. I'm glad you said the first thing, because I was going to have a much, much <laughs> less safe for work option of just stop giving an F, you have to. <laughs> But yours was a lot more nice to say thank you. <laughs> because it's true, at the end of the day, you're not gonna make everybody happy, right? You have to just be effective. It's work, it's not a charity, right? So you have to get the job done, your boss doesn't care, but I was nice to everybody and blah, 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 no. What, you have to take care of business and you have to do whatever it takes and sometimes it is gonna involve hard decisions, right? Sometimes it involves having to, you know, go and, and chastise someone if they're not pulling their weight or sometimes it involves having to have a team have those late nights and you just have to just do what it takes to get things done and not give an F about, I'm, I'm not saying that people's feelings, I'm just saying at the end of the day, you're accountable, right? So you can either be like super nice Mother Teresa and get screwed and yelled at and the client yells at you or you can just say, let's try to find that balance between making everybody-ish happy but then the day I have to deliver something. The other thing I want to have to say is like, you're not going to just one day wake up and realize that, okay, I don't give an F anymore because you don't go 180 and go, I suddenly care about everything to I don't care about anybody, right? You have to just kind of practice. It's like a muscle. I'm not going to suddenly win a marathon because I woke up one day and decided I'm going to run a marathon. You have to train and it's practice. So practicing in like little micro dynamics with everybody and just getting comfortable and then increasing the threshold about getting more and more assertive about things and getting, I think, encouraged in a workplace that fosters that kind of behavior, I think is important. Because some workplaces, they don't encourage that at all. They'll like think you're too whatever, and then you have to just find a place that does foster that. But yeah, just practice makes perfect, right? It's like I was a scared 20 whatever the heck year old when I had my first job, and now I'm like, I don't care about anything, I'm just gonna get stuff done, <laughs> right? And, it, and I'm not saying I run over people, I don't want you to think care what's rolling over everybody, but it's like, you have to just make hard decisions and get comfortable being assertive and just not caring what you say. Just, you're not gonna make everybody happy. You just can't. So how can you make, I guess, some or most people happy? That's pretty good. There are some days when I want to run over people. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure if you guys heard about this book. Um, it was a bestseller recently, How Not to Give. Yeah. And yes. Right? Yes. yes. I haven't read it, but that's all that book. I don't know. Like, I it's good. It. It's good. I love, it. I, it's I love that they publish it. Yes. So read it if you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Okay. So what is the question you're most tired of hearing on the subject of gender diversity, and what would you like to say about it so you never have to hear about it again? Oh my God. I'm still looking forward to this question. <laughs> okay, the one I'm most tired of hearing, and this is not on. The one I'm most tired of hearing is that when companies make extra efforts to hire more women, they're discriminating against men. <laughs> that is not true. It's not discrimination against men. It's an 
attempt to fix a systemic problem that has gone on for way too long. And for me personally, if I come across somebody in an interview who says, oh, your company wants to hire, doesn't want to hire men until they hire women, um, isn't that discrimination? I'll be like, yeah, thank you very much. You're not needed here. Because personally, I would never want to work with somebody who has a problem with a company trying to fix a systemic problem. And yes, it does lead to companies having to take hard decisions. It does lead to probably denying opportunities to some people. But at the end of the day, what at least personally I feel is that it's there's a lot more opportunities available to people out there, but there are far fewer which are making these radical and supposedly uh, decisions that will, that will, not supposedly, but decisions that will change the status quo. And if that's something that you're not okay with, then that's okay, dude. I'm sure you'll find another job. It shouldn't be a problem for you. But if there's a company and you want to support it, then please go ahead and do it. And I've had these conversations with people in my company where they would be like, oh, my friend wasn't hired because they needed to hire a woman. Like, I'm not sure that's true. But we're lowering standards when it comes to women. So you're telling me I'm here despite not being as skilled as you. And you're saying that to my face right now and you think that's okay. Um, but, but people do that. And yeah, I'm really tired of hearing that we're discriminating against men. We're not. <laughs> um, mine won't be that serious. Just uh, <laughs> what I uh, have experienced um, many times already. So. Um, like as women, let's say working in tech field, uh, who loves programming, people have the stereotype of you being geeky, nerd, like, you know, um, like messy, whatever. Um, and uh, let's say if I go out with, with my sales um, to meet my clients, uh, they see me in heels, dress up, oh, they think this person is not technical. Yeah? Like they, they, will, they will assume like you're like, you know, coming here for a pitch, whatever, this girl doesn't know what she's talking about. But it's not the case. Like, I can still dress up as I want, uh, as I like, but I can still be technical. I know my stuff. So I just feel so, I don't know, such an achievement whenever, you know, I change people's image of, uh, you know, um, of women who knows tech. We can still be stylish while being technical. <laughs> yeah. Not that <laughs> Uh, I think for me, it's a negative connotation that has started with the word feminist. When if you're a feminist, you're wrong. <laughs> like it shows that, oh, you're more concerned about women equality. It's not about the quality anymore. It's just about, you know, promoting women, gender diversity and everything. But it, it is required. Like right now, uh, New York Stock Exchange had one of the most female leaders after 200 years or so on. That is celebrated. That actually talks about you it talks about the volume of the problem, that we're celebrating the fact that one woman became a leader in the New York Stock Exchange. If we are breaking glass ceilings, it's a good thing, but that's actually the problem that everybody's trying to address, and being a feminist is not wrong. Like, being called a feminist is not wrong. That actually um, trickles me, like, it hurts me when people talk about that. I think mine would be, uh Probably that like harassment in the workplace is not something that happens amongst people like us. Uh, that one's a really frustrating one because if you read the news, look, it is happening, and it's probably even happening around you. You probably know people who have been um, responsible, and just not being defensive and trying to figure out how can we solve this for women right now and in the future would I think be a good solution to that versus saying no, it just doesn't happen in my workplace. Here. <laughs> Nothing to say. Okay. No, you covered it, and you covered yeah. it with the whole, the whole. You know, you can't be feminine. Suddenly, it invalidates you as someone technical. Because yeah. I wore heels in a nice, you know, outfit. It's like Jesus, really? <laughs> like I'm pretty sure, you know, the stylish outfit suddenly didn't make me dumber. <laughs> Yeah, and also I heard about, um, there's a quote, I think it was by Emma Watson, she was saying that a feminist means you're not looking for privilege, you're looking for equality. And a lot of people assume that the idea of feminist means you're looking for privilege, yeah. right? Yeah, well, that's an interesting to take note of. All right, so I want to give some time for the audience to ask questions as well. So let me just give this chance to the panelists to 
give a concluding oration, perhaps advice to the audience as to what they can do to get into tech consulting, perhaps, or any other comments on gender diversity? I know. She gave the look. <laughs> I think uh, now my mic finally works. <laughs> Don't uh, don't wait for the right moment. If you think tech consulting is your world, that's what you want to do. Take the leap, go for it. See what the requirements are of the job. If you like it, it's good. If, if you're a good fit, you everybody's around there to support you. Everybody is there to encourage you around. And if it does not fit, if it does not work out for you, you can always move back to marketing or to development. Even I, uh, I was a developer at Amazon previously. It was a good transition for me when I came to consulting. I was able to understand the business problems. I was able to, you know, enhance my soft skills. But I, at any point of time, I also know that if, if this never worked out for me, I could always move back to development. So don't wait, essentially. If you think this is the correct moment, you have built up your technical skills. You want to move, talk to recruiters, talk to HRs, talk to even internally in your company, there might be roles that might fit you. You might move to a consulting role, you might uh, move to a product manager role. You, there are avenues and everybody's there to support you, essentially. Uh, so I read this article that said that women only apply to jobs where they have like near 100% of the criteria, whereas men will apply to look anything. <laughs> so <laughs> don't do that. Um, <laughs> if you think that you are really interested in a role and you have at least some of the criteria that matches what they're looking for, there's no harm in applying and really being selling yourself because, again, that's something that we don't do enough of. Um, and there are many flavors of tech consulting, as you've probably understood by listening to the different women on this panel. So figure out the one that's right for you. I would say just um, keep trying and make the move. And then keep trying, going for interviews. Um, throughout the process, you actually figure out what you want, what you be, will be better fit in. Um, personal experience is that in the beginning of my job hunting, I was keep looking for a software developer because I was always been software developer. And then I figured actually I'm more, I will do better in the semi, you know, with a combination of communication and software, de de software development. So just keep trying, and then you will better understand yourself. Um, I think sort of going off of what Kritika said uh, and Winter, that just take the leap, uh, figure out what you might want to do and look for avenues to do that. Talk to people who might be in a similar space. Um, but the one thing I'd like to add is that be prepared to face challenges. Um, I don't think we've really called it out, but consulting is not an easy job. Um, for me, my biggest learning was how much patience it requires. Um, I learned that the hard way. Um, so yeah, there will be challenges, but at the same time, if that's something that you want to do, then don't let that deter you. Um, and yeah, you have six women here who are happy to talk to you. Um, and just, yeah, just reach out, uh, figure out what you want and just go for it. Uh, the first part about learning more about technical consulting, be proactive. Go follow like LinkedIn activity feeds of companies that you actually are interested in, whether it's a Deloitte, PwC, Bain, Oliver Wyman, McKinsey, whatever. To be honest with you, follow all of them. Just look at what their activity feeds say. Like they have a lot of like day in the life of like little articles, video interviews, and just get a gauge for what you feel the the culture could be like. Go to Glassdoor and read what people say about working there. See what people like, what they don't like, and don't be afraid to reach out to someone random at, at a, at a consulting firm on LinkedIn and be like, hey, I'd love to see if you have 20 minutes, you know, get on a quick, you know, Skype call or something and just talk to you about what does it mean to be a technical consultant, right? Tell me the good, the bad, the ugly. So just be proactive, right? A passive approach doesn't get you there. And you have to just go out there, learn about it, and be able to absorb the good, the bad, the ugly. And also make those random connections as well. Go to maybe meetups, for example, where they have technical consultants readily, you know, available to answer questions. Um, follow, I'm sorry, yeah, exactly, right, exactly. And uh, just like social events that some of these consulting firms will also hold. I know that, you know, Oliver Wyman holds some meet and greets, I'm sure that Bain does, et cetera, and Mavericks, and 
just follow these things, follow their Twitter you know, handles and see what events they're promoting, Deloitte, et cetera, and just show up and just ask questions. It's just, it doesn't hurt. In regards to helping with like diversity, I think, be proactive again. Don't just have a passive approach of, oh, I hashtag me too, or oh, I have a Facebook <laughs> picture with colorful blahs. Like, that's so passive, that does nothing, right? You just, you literally just showed, hi, I'm aware, and that's it, right? Take it to the next level. At work, join an organization that really tries to help recruit people from diverse backgrounds, not just women, everything, LGBT, physically, you know, able people, educational, geographical diversity, anything, and just try to be there and help recruit aggressively at organizations that actually help push for more of people in tech that are from diverse backgrounds. Like, I know there's like a, a black women in machine learning at an event I'm gonna go to North America next year. That's cool, right? So it just, it needs, it's about being proactive in both facets, not just this whole Facebook and hi, I like something and I'm done, right, for the day, so. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for your wise words. I'll now open it up to the audience. Does anyone have any questions for them? You can direct it at anyone personally. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, so um, when you talk about tech consulting, especially I come from the coding world, so um, I'm more of looking for um, advice on people who code as con consultants. Um, so you're supposed to, I mean, I've hired consultants before, and uh, what I've looked at that point in time was, um, does he have the, does he or she have skill sets uh, from, you know, which has a pretty broad uh, breadth. So how do you keep up like, um, if, let's say, you're uh, an expert in JavaScript? But the, the actual company, the client, is expecting you to do stuff on Java and .NET as well. So, so what do you do to keep up? I can answer that question right now. I'm going to get asked that all the time. I'm a software engineer specialist for Oliver Wyman, right? And so we get constantly put up against, hey, you know, we have COBOL and, uh, yes. you know, mainframe. You're like, okay. Yes. So at the end of the day, I mean, it really boils down to can we find someone actually who can and wants to do it? It's not just about, okay, I'm just going to suddenly want to do this, first of all. I have no desire in downscaling in COBOL, right? Uh, at the end of the day, it's about can you deliver what the client needs and can you actually coax them into something else, maybe a more modern approach? Maybe because they, they ask for COBOL, that's all they know. Versus you can say, actually, why don't we look into leveraging something else, you know, microservices to expose blah, 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 and you just blow their minds when you're like, whoa, what? So I feel like it's your responsibility to help educate them about the better options and also maybe helping them transition to like some kind of digital transformation you know, strategy where they can move away from this crazy stuff, right? But in terms of general tech like .NET or Java, I feel like you have to have, I feel like in my opinion, to be like somewhat of a fungible technologist. You just have to be. Because technology, the hot, sexy framework of the week, you know, is suddenly replaced by something else, you know? I mean, I'm sure you remember Cold Fusion. Look what happened with that, you know? And exactly, right? You know, and then you had Knockout, and then you have Vue and Angular, and now it's React and blah, blah, blah. So you have to be fungible and flexible, but only within, within reason. So you have to just pick and choose your battles about, is this technology going to benefit the client? Is it something I want to work on or someone else, you know? And what values it bring versus let's figure out a better way to actually get to the, to the answer that's going to solve their problems. Yeah, so sure. just to add to what uh, Carlin said, that... Um, in my opinion, technology, like you said, right? There was Vue and Angular, and now there's React and a whole bunch of other different things. Technology comes and goes all the time. The basic fundamentals of programming don't necessarily change. I mean, the skill set is that, right? Can you solve problems? Can you figure out a way of doing a certain thing a certain way? Syntax and code and this and that is all out there, right? It's all documented, unless you're using something super obscure, like we were once Google Polymer in like before release one and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I think for me, the, the question, and when I interview people for, for our company, it's about, okay, you know Java, great, but how do you solve X problem? We are not asking if you can do it in Java, we're asking can you solve it? Um, and often we just ask them that question, okay, sure, you worked in Java, but if you had to do this in .NET, will you be willing to pick it up? And more, most often than not, people will say, yeah, sure, why not? And then we'd probably interview them that way. If somebody says, no, I won't need on Java, I'm never touching anything else, then that's probably a red flag right there. There's only so much you can do with quick sort or bubble sort, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. 
Hi, I feel like uh, the panel here, all, uh, all the women are very confident and like I feel like you are all very strong. I wonder if I'm it is all... That's why. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I wonder if this is like a personality thing. Are you always like this or is it? <laughs> <laughs> or are there some critical experience, the stories that you have experienced and you learn from it? And I feel like many um, new uh, women new to technology industry want to someday be like you. How do they transform from like the, you know, like any like, learning that's from all the way? Maybe I can share, because um, actually I am not a very confident public speaker, honestly. Um, I think over the years I have picked up the confidence from the achievement I have made. I think definitely confidence comes from your experience. Let's say uh, one year ago if you asked me to be here, I wouldn't be able to speak a single word. Um, but I guess like over the experience you make some achievement in your job, in your career, you actually you know, um, you know that you can actually do this. You know, just over the experience, practice, and and you know, just over. You will pick it up. Like some people are born to be good public speaker, uh, very confident. You know, very extrovert. But there are cases where you know you can still pick it up and then just be. Um, you know, build up your confidence over your achievement. I think I follow the latter path, and it worked out. I hope. Yeah. I'll give you two really tactical pointers. Um, one is record yourself speaking and then watch yourself. <laughs> and mute and then just watch your body language and you'll see what you're doing that is taking away from your confidence. And then just listen and you'll see where you start to speak very fast, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. You just gotta keep practicing that. I've done that many, many times. Second is take an improv class. Um, are you all familiar with improv, improvisation? Yeah, uh, <laughs> improvisation is awesome because it forces you to fail, react in the moment, collaborate, and just go up there and say stuff when you have nothing prepared and nothing planned. And when you start failing regularly, which I did during improv class, it becomes a lot easier to be comfortable with failure in a social setting, which gives you more confidence as well. So, sorry, Isha, you had something? I always have something. Yeah. <laughs> To answer your question, I am always like this <laughs> in public. Uh, let's let's go with that. Um, I personally and a lot of people around me follow the fake it till you make it approach. You just pretend that what you know exactly what you're talking about and say it like practice it a million times. I've I speak a lot, but like not just generally, but in public on in in forums. I mean. Um, but I still like I'm losing my shit whenever I have to go up and speak. Uh, Purnima saw me before my DevOps days talk. <laughs> I didn't pay her to say that. Um, and uh, yeah, like you say, just it, it, it comes with practice, of course. But the other tactical thing I would suggest is set small goals, small achievable goals. Maybe something like, okay, I am going to give a five minute presentation in this setting. It could be a group of your colleagues that you're comfortable around. The next step could be something like a women who code meetup. The next step could be uh, proposing a talk for an event, writing a blog. And I think building that builds helps build your confidence. Ask for feedback very, very aggressively. Like make people give you feedback. I had somebody who would say, don't give me on any of this or oh, you did great bullshit. I need to know what I need to work on. Um, I'm not saying that's what you should do. <laughs> but yes, definitely ask for feedback, set small uh, achievable goals and find somebody who can help you monitor your goals. Set up a Trello board if you want. I think if you're passionate about something, you tend to speak more confidently about it. Be passionate, be, you know, keep reading, whether it's HBR reviews or something, keep reading, be passionate and just start talking in meetings, start presenting your features. Even if it's a small technical solution, it's a marketing solution, go ahead, present your solutions to your team. That's going to help. Even asking a question right now shows that you are confident. So, that, so thanks for that. Okay, I think I have something to add as well. Uh, I used to have a fear of public speaking. So that was one thing that I suffered as a kid. Uh, but my parents actually put me in a lab. I know it sounds weird. It's a 
the psychological lab and what they did was actually <laughs> put me I know it sounds strange it was in a university they put me in front of a computer show me really disturbing images that would flash before my eyes like and then it's, it's some kind of research that they were doing I don't know what they were trying so and then after looking at those disturbing images they would like push me to be like in front of like a crowd and just give me a placard with a word and just like start a monologue and I know it's 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 the it's word aggressive. I know it's so aggressive but let just let me give you some tips about um, giving presentations right so number one uh, try to look at people's noses it actually helps it, it looks as if like you're looking at them but yeah actually I'm just looking at her nose you know <laughs> And secondly, just focus on specific people in the room, if that helps, so you don't overwhelm yourself with the idea that there are so many people, <laughs> you know. Um, I think thirdly, because in consulting, you're required to present a lot, right? And sometimes, you know, your boss or your co colleague may just push you in front of the client and say, hey, you present this. Um, just don't be intimidated in that sense. You may think, oh God, like, there's such a bunch of senior people, you know, on leadership boards and whatnot, but just, just treat them as friends, I would say. Yeah, just keep telling yourself that. Following up on that really <laughs> insanely <laughs> aggressive I mean, I it too experiment far. with psychology. <laughs> I'll come up with a recommendation. This may be unorthodox a little bit too. Get out of your comfort zone. It kind of follows along with what you're saying. Do the whole improv. But take it one step further. I say, do like a week. Fully immerse of doing the opposite of what you normally would do get out of your comfort zone. So if you normally would say yes to something, say no. If you normally would say no to something, say yes. And just just go with the flow. And if you happen to see something like, you know, that looks random that you never in a million years would do or participate in, just do it. And just get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And have a good time with it. I think you'll be surprised. You know, you'll meet interesting people. You'll have an interesting story to tell your friends and family, but it's just about getting comfortable. It's about practice, like you said, you know, little baby goals and baby steps. You're not gonna suddenly develop, you know, like all the Schwarzenegger muscles overnight, <laughs> right? You're gonna have to take time to work out. It takes baby steps and training and you just have to practice until it makes perfect. So just start with something that just gets you out of your comfort zone. Because yeah. ultimately what makes you confident is you just don't care anymore, right? Nothing will unnerve you because you're like, whatever. Plus I'm old and jaded, so I don't care about anything <laughs> anymore, which helps. Yeah, be fearless. <laughs> okay, I think there's another question. Yeah. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hi, okay. uh, so like, um... Hello. Yeah, hi. Uh, so, all of you have been in your respective fields for quite some time. So, I'm more interested in like the failures because <laughs> I know that being in uh, tech consulting, not every single project is a successful story. So like, <laughs> I believe in learning more from failures, just like in programming. You fail, you keep failing in your code until you finally discover where you failed and then you learn from that. So are there any stories uh, regarding like uh, failed projects <laughs> and in this area you that you like want to share? Hours. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is going to take a while. <laughs> Like maybe like the most interesting ones and like Again, one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, go for it first. Oh I think I have a defective <laughs> 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 I guess we've all we've all just accepted it. Um I'll go with the most recent one, which was about six months ago maybe. No less. Four months. Um we were engaged to do enablement for a bank in Singapore. And by enablement, um, I mean that we were supposed to go in, work with their, one of their development teams, and help them upskill on agile and extreme programming. So skills like test-driven development, um, continuous integration and continuous delivery, stuff like uh, how do you do Git branching, how do you map a path to production, that sort of thing. And um, we went in and realized that nobody on the ground had any idea why we were there or what we did. Um, the, the leadership had just decided, yep, we're going to go agile, get these people in. And they did. But there was no buy-in from people on the floor. So there was a lot of pushback, a lot of battles being fought every single day. We said, 
Oh, your developers are not writing tests. But look, our code coverage is 90%. Yeah, but your tests are not doing anything. <laughs> yeah, but they're all green. <laughs> like, just go back and forth all the time. Um, we have walls, story walls, right? Oh, this thing has been there for six weeks. Yeah, I have to send an email. Okay, when are you going to send it? I'll send it today. Okay, next morning. Did you send that email? No, I'll send it today. So you just say so the same thing over and over again, right? And you run out of patience eventually. And that is what happened. That both they and us, we ran out of patience. We said, you know what? Don't think this is going to work out. And we left like after some four or five weeks of that engagement. And what I've discovered recently is that team has not delivered anything till date. Um, probably won't for another year. Um, but the, the thing we learned from that, from that engagement and that horrifying non-enablement experience is that you have to pick your battles, one. You have to know which things you want to push and which you just want to let slide. And two, that you have to make sure that you have the trust, especially in a consulting um, job, that you have the trust of the people that you're working with. And now we're engaged with the same client again, and we, we know what, what we did wrong the last time, and which we definitely don't want to do. And it's definitely a much smoother journey, which I was just telling people at work today is making me super paranoid. This is a little too easy. Maybe it's too good to be true. But um, yeah, uh, hopefully that, that uh, answers your question about one, uh, my most recent failure. Um, yeah, maybe a quick one. I mean, I make failure every day, um, <laughs> big or small. But I guess the biggest one was the was the one I made on my the first assignment I had in my in this job. I was very new to this field. I was very new to ad tech. I was very new to consulting. Uh, very new to client engagement. Um, but then my my sales pulled me into a conversation with one of the media agency uh, for a bank, uh, basically to replicate a conversion tracking solution they're having with another competitor. Uh, and the current setup they have done is very complicated. <laughs> so I put lots of efforts in uh, redesigning the integration with our platform um, to you know, research what are the API we could use, um, have lots of conversation with internal engineers on the feasibility, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, I dedicated a huge number of hours in there. But it turned out, you know, essentially, um, there wasn't much commitment from the agency, from the media agency, neither from the client, you know. So it's essentially it's just myself running the show, you know, like try to make progress, whereas the, the rest is not really, doesn't think this is a big deal, you know. And um, there's also a lack of, um, you know, communication from myself. Ideally, you know, uh, he or she could have told me, you know, um, it, me, this might be not a case that you want to spend that much time. But having said that, I think I learned a lesson <coughs> that, you know, you should actually, before you invest your efforts, your time, you should understand how much commitment from, from your stakeholders, you know, how, how, what's the impact basically, you know, before you land your investment in there. I'll just talk about in general why projects go critical. One could be the new business, when you write a proposal for the client, what you promised to the client could not be delivered within that timeline. You wrote that because you wanted to win the client maybe, or maybe those requirements were not gathered by the technical team who's delivering it. So one learning is that when you're writing a new proposal or a new project, you talk to your team, try to understand what the timeline should be. That is one learning that I've learned. The second is you might think that uh, all the resources, all your team members would always be on that project, but that's never the case. They might go on leaves. They might get pulled out into different projects, different resources. So your projects tend to go critical at that point of time. So what we have learned is, A, talk to your team members, talk, plan ahead as much as you can, add in buffers, and always have, be, be, be honest to your clients. Always keep them, uh, you know, Talk to them, talk to them that this is the progress of the project, this is what's happening. If a client is well informed about the, the status of the project, they would be much more happy or much more calmer. That is one of the learnings. And third is always, it's not just about the consultant, it's about the team that you're leading. It's about understanding your team should have a good work-life balance. That's a major plus through. Sometimes your team may not feel motivated to work, but at that point of time, you need to realize 
what clicks for one developer may not click for the designer, may not click for another developer. We're just trying to understand your team more, to you know, focus on that team, essentially will help you bring, you know, a critical project to a successful project as well. So these are the three learnings or the three common points that I've seen where projects generally tend to fail. I wish I had spoken with Kritika before my last project, so <laughs> everything we failed at, she just described. <laughs> you have a horror story to share? No, I'm fine not reliving it, but we should have done exactly what she said. <laughs> Looks like the PTSD is strong. Um, <laughs> One other project I was, I was asked to help out, I, I wasn't part of it, I got asked to come in and help identify what was going to hell. And it was because a project had not been properly scoped. It had been scoped out by someone who doesn't understand technology. So if you come in and you ask me to be your, for example, interior designer and I'll make up some crap and then I expect someone to implement it, that's just crazy, right? Um, so the person that, that SOW'd it out had no business and ended up making crazy, 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 of course, promises that just couldn't be done in the time frame that was promised. And so when I came in, I saw a disarray multitude of things. It was, no one had asked, for example, the simple question during discovery of, what browsers do you want this thing to work on? Oh my God, I see you cracking up because, <laughs> right? Guess what? IE8, <laughs> surprise, right? And you're like, oh my God, are you guys crazy? They had to support IE8+, plus, not just Chrome, and it was insane. So that was just one nightmare. The other nightmares were around people leading the project from like a tech lead perspective who were brand new to the company and had no business doing it. They had no idea how to do the role. No one had told them about expectations. No one had onboarded them to the responsibilities. And so they were just, that person was just deer in headlights and just shut down and wasn't communicating with anybody. It was pretty bad. On top of that, people that thought they knew what Scrum meant it's a stand-up. You're like, oh my God, no, it's not just a freaking stand-up, you know? And so they were running these scrum ceremonies, and I'm observing, and I'm like, oh my God, what are you doing? You know, they just start moving everything over because they slipped a whole bunch of crap from like one sprint to another, and it was just like, guys, what? No, and it was just one thing after another. So it was honestly a matter of, it was a combination of bad comms, bad scoping, bad leadership, and nobody there to make sure like everything was just getting tended to. It was, it was insane. So, because people don't understand, like something as simple as what browser do you need to support and on what platforms can just add complete amounts of scope. So, thank you for laughing at the IE, because you knew, you knew what was coming. That sounded like my last project, just the same project. Oh my God. Um, to, give you an, to give you an example, at some point someone said, uh, on a scoping piece, yeah, can we just move this, um, you know, this button, and can we just change this feature? Because you know, on a slide, it would take five minutes to do that. <laughs> oh yeah, it's good. It's great. Oh, uh, project is always about. It's a triangle. I don't know what it's called, but it's scope, time, money. If one changes, it's going to impact the rest too. So if you understand this little basic. Your project can go from a success to a failure or vice versa. Hold on, there's that rule. There's that rule. <laughs> you only get two out of three things. You can get it fast, you can done it, get it done quality, and you can get it done cheaply. Right? And you can never have all these three things. You're just not going to get them. The people, they want it always. <laughs> Think always. about that. Always. Give me everything. Yeah. I know, right? For $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask you Oh. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, as, as consultants, um, and to your question on how, how do you project yourself more positively, um, how do you deal with negotiations? Salary, um, and also, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you have to uh, also look at consulting rates. I don't know if you do that. Um, so, what, what would your advice be to newbie consultants? Um. You have to find out what the market value is, right? So someone getting paid X amount in San Francisco is going to get paid very differently in like India. So what's the market value for what your average skill set is? So you want to see what that is and see what the skills are for that level, what that entails, and kind of put yourself against that and see how you, you know, how you sit and compare. Are you the same? Are you less and more? And you have to also factor in market demand, right? So it's not just about you know, average salary. It's about demand at the time, like as I'm sure. <laughs> You guys know, like there's certain hot 
you know, roles that are trying to be filled out there, and you can demand and command a lot more money than you normally would. So just be honest and think about what you're really worth, not, don't be scared to ask for a ton. Don't be, don't be scared to ask for things that you want that are outside the norm. Ask for lots of money, and if you're awesome, and ask for extra vacation, and ask for whatever bonus kind of, you know, percentage. Just ask for it. And then when you've gone through the interview process, I, I interview people when they're awesome. I'm not going to suddenly go at the end and go, oh, you wanted X amount. Sorry, see you later, right? We're trying to negotiate back and forth, and we're trying to work with you. But it's worth starting off this high and then coming down to this where it's still really awesome, right? It's just like bartering at like a you know market. You know? It's like <laughs> You gotta know when you're gonna walk away, right? So if you yeah. if you yeah. know you really really want that job, yeah. you're not gonna so walk away from it. Then at some point, sure. and they're not, you know, working with you in the yeah. negotiation. Yeah, but sure. if you're okay to walk away from it, then you really can push. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you could also take people forget that you could also negotiate your flexible benefits. Uh, one more tactic to negotiate is also to find a second job. Talk to your current company and be like, I already have an offer from the XYZ company. Maybe they increase your salary. The different negotiation skills that might work for, like, at what space you are in at that point of time. You always have. <laughs> we, we've established that already. Um, I think one realization after uh, coming to Singapore and working with a startup is uh, be honest with yourself. Be be aware of what your skill set is. Um, one, of course, if you're great, then yes, no. But if you know you're lacking things, then know that as well. Uh, because one thing that has op ha uh, happened quite often with us, we interview somebody who has maybe eight, nine years of experience. But when we interview them, we realize that they're more at a mid-level mid sort of a skill set. And then we offer them a salary accordingly. And they say, oh, no, but I have nine years of experience. You can't be giving me that much money. But dude. That's what we think we can offer you based on your skill set at the moment. So being aware of your gaps as well as your skills is very important in my opinion. Um, and two is, yeah, know what you want, do your research. And if, it's, if it doesn't fit what you want, just yeah, know, know if you want to walk away. Though I think salary is important, but at the same time, if you really like that role, you think that opportunity fits well for you, that is, that is a skill that you want to pursue, Go ahead, do it, even if it's at a low, lower pay, maybe. Because if you're good at it, you will definitely, you know, your salary will, will get a baseline. You will, you know, get promoted and so on. So if it's a skill, like if you're moving to consulting, let's say, you might, maybe you're getting paid X, you might go to X minus Delta because you're moving to a new role. But don't let that stop you. Like, it's not like you will grow into that role. You might st start at a low position, but it's, it's, it's okay. Exactly in my case, when I moved, um, uh, you know, changed my job basically from software engineer to uh, consultant, from banking industry to ads industry, um, from Japan to Singapore. It's so, it's like many change at one time. Um, so my, like, you know, the, the base does, does you know, uh, change. Uh, but actually, you know, overall, Google gave a very good package, like you know, you know all the free food. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna just look at you know, <laughs> yeah. So I think, um, um, I think you know what you want. You know, it doesn't matter if you're let's say salary drop like temporarily. Um, look at the whole picture. Look at the big picture. Yeah. On that, really tactically, I quantified so I. Um, took a change in role so that I would get more sustainability and less travel, but then I quantified what my pay per hour was <laughs> as a result of the sustainability, and I'm still making much more, and the benefits are yeah. worth it. So be really tactical, like are you going to get training programs that will be useful to you in the market value of those that then add to your uh, portfolio, etc., etc. So you got to take in all of those. Okay, um, I have one more question. And thank you very much for sharing all your experiences. It was really great. Good advice as well. Thank you. <laughs> Horror story. Yep. And um, I'd like to ask, oh yes, what's the most enjoyable or rewarding thing about tech consulting? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Only horror stories, yeah. 
I think when a solution gets delivered, when it's launched and your team and you go out and celebrate, and essentially even that solution might help the, the general public as well. So just understanding that you've built something and it's there out in the world to view and it's still there, it, 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 it helps you essentially. That's one of the most enjoyable moments that I had celebrating with my team. <laughs> because with regular consulting, you give a bunch of slides and you walk away and you know <laughs> what happens then. But then if you build something, you get to see it, which is amazing. And it's in the newspaper and it's, you know, people actually talk about it, even if it's not always good feedback. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would say the diversity of projects because yeah. technology, right? It's so different. The landscape is so different for every client every geography, everywhere, just anything. And so one day I could be dealing with cloud stuff, and another day I could be dealing with some really crazy legacy you know, systems, and the next day I could be dealing with .NET, the next day I could be dealing with Vue. Doesn't matter. And it's really awesome because I was telling someone this. It's like I, I equate being a technical consultant to being an emergency department doctor <laughs> because you get thrown at you just random stuff, and you just, it's, it's not for everybody, right? Some people get daunted by that. I love it because it's so different every time. It's not just working on something for four years. It's working on something for some client and some geography, and they're solving some random stuff, and I have to figure out what the best solution is based on their you know, technology and systems landscape and where they want to go with the roadmap, and it's, just, it's always something different, and I love that. Yeah, I think just to add on to that, um, so at least in my firm, this may not apply to all consulting firms. Um, if you're a generalist, you get a chance to look at other industries. So you don't have to specialize, but you can request to specialize in a certain industry if you want. But if you're at the stage of your career where you, you, <laughs> you think you want to explore different industries and different kind of technical projects, you can do that. So diversity is definitely the plus point. I guess for me, two, um, two perspectives. One is when your project got delivered. Uh, one recent case I had is for a sports um, brand. We developed a very interesting ad during the World Cup, FIFA World Cup. Basically, we have a live score component in the display ads. So whenever you see the ads, the live score will be also there. And literally during the night when everyone was watching foot, um, the, the match, I was staring, browsing the internet, trying to find my ads. And I found my ads. I was like, yeah, this is my stuff. <laughs> it's like, this is the, maybe the first time I'm, I'm getting so excited seeing ad, ads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I spotted my ads. So that's when your, when your work got, got delivered. Second is when I receive, you know, the very heartwarming, you know, thank you notes from my clients or from myself, you know, saying, um, you know, thanks for showing their appreciation, you know, your understanding of technology, um, you know, your design or whatever, the service we provide, the, we provide to them has really helped to change the way they work, they deliver, you know, their stuff. So that's really, really fulfilling to me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to say. <laughs> um, I actually don't have anything new to add. What did I talk? <laughs> uh, my first international business trip, play, paid by my client, was also an enjoyable moment. But that was the that was only the first trip, not after that. <laughs> okay, so. Actually, I really wanted to talk about my horror story since it's Halloween, right? Might as well. <laughs> Just to answer your question. Because, this, because my, my fail project was quite different from theirs. Everything seemed well. Um, just to give you some context, right? Uh, it was a telco client and it was an IT outsourcing project. This was a deal worth billions of dollars. So like everyone was just anticipating the contract signing day, right? So we were on track, scope, timing, ev timelines, everything established, everything was followed. Up to negotiations. So negotiations was supposed to end the day before contract signing, but it ended up spilling over onto the contract signing date. So they were working overnight, right? And on the contract signing day itself, everyone prepared everything, photo booths, balloons, everyone went to the salon, got their hair done, all the media was there, you know, ready to take pictures. <laughs> and the contract wasn't signed because there was one clause the final clause that they were negotiating and 
someone on the client team got sensitive and didn't like what the vendor was talking about and called it off. So sometimes these things you just cannot expect. And I think and we had to rerun the entire project again. And this was like a whole half year again, doing the exact same thing with the same with different vendors because you know they didn't like that vendor, right? But yeah, so just just be prepared that sometimes in consulting you really cannot expect um, things to go as planned sometimes. Yeah, you just have to learn to adapt. Yeah, adaptability. I think that's one thing to take note of. Yeah. Fun stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay, any other lasting questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm just curious to know, um, what is the most important thing that you know now that you wish you knew back then? Because after all, you guys um, started up new in consulting. So I believe you guys must have um, create kind some kind of journey for yourself to become like where you are today. Sorry for using the word guys. <laughs> <laughs> Do you realize? So I can keeping the traditional. Um, the one thing that I wish I knew when I started off was that it's okay to not have all the answers. Um, there is this, maybe in, in my head at least, there was this expectation that being a consultant and being in front of a client means that I have to know exactly the right thing to say at all times. But the one thing that I feel I've hopefully achieved now is being okay with the fact that there are things I don't know and admitting it. Just saying that, uh, you know what, actually, I'm not quite sure. Let me go back, uh, check on that, and I'll get back to you on it. And it's okay to do that. Um, so that's, that's my one thing. You will learn all sorts of things. One of my projects, I learned about pig farming. <laughs> Not something I expected to learn about. <laughs> and then I went on to steal. <laughs> and then I went on to coffee. <laughs> then I came to insurance. So <laughs> you will learn something about everything. Oh, you mean steel industry. Steel industry. You mean learn to steal. <laughs> there was no stealing from the big farming. <laughs> She's probably thinking, why is everyone so just normal? <laughs> and you learn how to listen very carefully. <laughs> I think for me, it was managing my team, understanding what clicks for them, that, and understanding why projects fail, and trying to apply those solutions to the next project, and seeing how they fail. <laughs> I would say it's okay to say no. I would tell 24-year-old Carolyn, it's okay to say no. Because when you're younger, along most of your career, you want to make everybody happy, you want to seem like you're working hard, you're a team player, and just everything everybody asks you, you go, sure. Next thing you know, you're like, I don't know what sleep means anymore. <laughs> no, it's okay to say no. It's all good. Um, I actually couldn't think of any like advice because I'm still trying to figure out my way. Like you know, um, early in my career, relatively. Um, but I would say, just to echo back on Caroline's point, just don't be afraid to say no. Um, I had a, a period in my career where I just want to be nice to everyone, take on everyone's ask. And just, I didn't burn out, but really I have to work extra hour to deliver very minor, minor stuff, end up delaying the big delivery that I should have done. So I feel like you sometimes have to learn to push back, say no, and not, doesn't mean you're not nice, you're still a nice person, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, we're all like in workplace, in corporate world. We have to, you know, fight for our own way. You know, other people, of course, if you if you keep accepting whatever they ask, they will always come to you, and they might not even have appreciation. So, don't be afraid to say no. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I think everyone should know and practice is go home if you're sick. <laughs> don't work when you're sick. <laughs> um, I've seen way too many people just work themselves to the ground because they refuse to take a sick day off. 
the world will go on it's okay <laughs> things will get delivered if not they might get delivered a day later that's fine your health is important and if your team doesn't understand that you need to find a new team yeah no. so i'm i'm going to add on to um carolyn and winter so don't be afraid to say no but also don't be afraid to hear the word no like you one of my mentors taught me to be fearless right so you just ask and what's the worst that can happen you just you hear no and just develop a thick skin and you just move on yeah um yeah also just to add on know your priority like know what mm. matters to you what's most important to you and make others aware of that uh let's say in back in Tokyo uh, my teammate think i shouldn't go to gym during the the working hour but i should exercise <laughs> i mean um, fitness is my 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 priority so i mean just make it you know make others aware of your priority and then as long as i got work done it's it's okay right so i think yeah i am i'm going to hear more about your tokyo i know <laughs> lots of story it is like really sexy that's why like drop the mic up uh also say yes to challenging opportunities uh everybody there to support you as i said before don't worry like say yes as well when needed okay any other questions yeah uh, i have a general question because i feel like uh, this consulting job is very high intense so <laughs> how do you guys i'm sorry how do you manage your stress and pressure when you in high intense situation I know <laughs> caffeine. I know caffeine. <laughs> like a <of> sleep. <laughs> yeah, mentally physical. Yeah, actually I I'm currently in the I would say the busiest busiest months of the year or business mo- busiest months of my career in this job so far. And uh, honestly, I've been working long hour. Um it's just my choice. I mean, you will uh, there are peak hour and like fast and s- uh, slow period, right? I will make sure myself get like vacation after i get my project delivered but especially at this period i i i don't mind that you can in extra hour to get stuff done at the same time i try to maintain at least like a one hour every day going to gym and you know have a quality you know into switch switch on that's you and switch <laughs> off switch off so you better you um you need to have the switch off time you know whether it's a spotting whether it's um you know have a proper meal whatever so have your mind a, a break a short break during the peak period and then have a long break when you can have a vacation i think every job comes with stress it's just not consultants everybody has a peak time and a low time whether it's a developer whether you're in marketing so it everybody is dealing with stress and Uh, learn how to disconnect is the main thing learn how to say no to the clients learn how to inform the clients even when the project has started that you're not available on weekends you're not there to answer emails after 10 just setting expectations is the most crucial answer and just start, you know having that work life balance hey, this is a bit controversial but look you're going to have very high stress moments on consulting and so when you have days when there it's not stressful go home early and do something you want to do and that's okay everyone's going to understand um that you really can't escape it um you, you can deal with it but you can't escape it during sometimes so whenever you can you should i mean it definitely is not get easy i mean i know every job has stress but let's be honest consulting is crazy like I juggle three time zones and travel a lot and it wears you down it really does and so what I find helps to me is when I get to make the most of my situation so if I'm traveling for work I'll make sure like I actually try to enjoy myself and enjoy the city or the country that I'm in and just like everyone's saying disconnect just turn it all off and just have fun walk around be a tourist you know enjoy the whatever the scenery and try to make the most of your situation. If you're having those late nights with a team as I'm sure all of you have, everybody here, just have, you know, have a little fun with it, right? And and just have just have the fun meal with the team or just, you know, poke fun at each other, just try to make light of a situation that's already really fraught with stress, right? And the camaraderie you build with the team really makes a huge difference when you're in those really rough times. 
Because if it's all work, I mean, I've worked on teams where they were just like all work and they were just wouldn't crack any jokes and you're like, oh my God, these people are cyborgs, you know? But when you have that fun camaraderie, you're poking at fun at each other, you're like, let's take a break, it's 1 a.m., let's grab a beer, F this, you know? It's great, it helps to make, it helps to offset the crazy stress. Yeah, surround yourself with good people. It's most important. Okay, so I think we're running a bit over time. We have time for one last question, if there's any. <coughs> no? Going once, going twice? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we're done. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Last, okay. Yeah, I, think, I think this is a good one to run it off with. Mm -hmm. um, given that this was also about diversity, do you have any of you ever experienced where you get the feeling like, okay, now us women are just over-exaggerating, now we're just moaning you know we're like oh you know everybody should be treated equally that's what we try to aim for that's when companies should hire women instead of men do you ever feel like you know you're in a room with women and diversity comes up and then they they just take it over the top and they start nagging and it's just too much this may be controversial but yeah i feel like if something is shoved in your face 24 7 it loses its value because A, I, I, I feel very passionate about diversity, but that's me. It's just like some people feel passionately about causes like animal rights, right? Just because you don't doesn't mean you're Satan, right? It just means that's not your passion. And so I don't want you to push your stuff on me. I'm not gonna push diversity on others as well. Like, I know that some of the females in the groups I work with, some of them are like, yeah, some of the you know, people at the company are like forcing me to show up to some of these things about women and whatever, and they're like, it's like, not like I don't support women, but it's like I don't really want to do this, you know? And so it has to be something that people are on board with. And if it gets to the point where it's too just invasive and too forced, it loses its value, I feel like. So it has to be something that's more organic, informative, and organic. It's a, it's a fine line. It's hard. It's hard. I'm glad you brought that up. There's a difference between complaining. There's a difference between being that person who just changes their profile picture and puts me to one stuff, and then you know being solution oriented. So, um, if it's just a bunch of complaining with no action, then I can understand why people would get frustrated with it. But if it converts into something that's actionable, tactical, and would make a difference, uh, then it's valuable. So yeah. the, again, fine line. Right. I think it's important to. Sorry, I didn't wait for the mic to come to me. <laughs> um, I think it's important to ask that question, okay, yes, there are these problems. What are we doing about it? What do you propose to do about it? If they say, oh, I don't really have a solution, I just think this is a really bad state of things. Well, yeah, you're right, it is. But seriously, what are we achieving by sitting here and complaining about it? Um, I've done that to people and I've pissed people off with that, but at the end of the day, it's like you say, it's complaining and changing your profile picture versus being solution oriented. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to be the person who says, yes, but what do we do about it? How do you propose we fix that? Um, and make it a more constructive conversation than just being like moaning about, oh, women have it so hard. Great. Last one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think having a healthy discussion versus complaining is a very fine line. I think when people start complaining or using it as an excuse to not work, sometimes might irritate me, let's, let's be honest. Mm. Yep, final words, be proactive. <laughs> okay, so I think that's it. Thank you so much to the panelists for dedicating their time to here today. As well as to you guys, thank you so much. Um, so Yelin will talk about the next session that we have. So thanks everyone for coming. So a uh, couple of words. Um, Thank you, Engineers SG, for recording. Thank you so much. You'll find